My name is Tristan Sands. I'm an assistant professor of neurology at Columbia University. And I'm a pediatric epileptologist by training um, with, with a clinical and research bent towards uh, genetic causes of epilepsy and neurodevelopmental disability. And epilepsy is a term that I think is pretty commonly known as something that causes seizures, and that's a pretty simple definition. But why is diagnosing and treating epilepsy more complicated than that description might uh, might entail? Uh, epilepsy um, is, I guess, what makes it the, you know, what makes it simple is that it's a risk for seizures, but what makes it complex is that there are many different types of epilepsy and many ways that that risk for seizures can manifest in uh, individual patients. Um, and I think the, the most important um, aspect of it and the part that I think we uh, as clinicians worry about uh, regularly in the field of epilepsy is the concerns that the disturbances to the EEG and disturbances uh, in the form of seizures um, have the potential to impact patients um, beyond their, you know, the, the cause of their epilepsy or their seizures. The, the, in other words, add to their neurodevelopmental disability beyond the etiology itself. And, and so, uh, for instance, a KIF-1A mutation. Within that context, it sounds really important to, you know, get a handle on epilepsy subtype and consequences, you know, as soon as possible. And we have a lot of parents who, uh, share videos or descriptions of their uh, child behavior and ask, is, is this a seizure or an epilepsy? Uh, what kind of things do you take into consideration when trying to figure out what type of uh, epilepsies might be manifesting in a child? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, definitely part of it is uh, what is a seizure, what is not a seizure? Um, th those sorts of things are critical. Um, uh, because uh, folks can have an abnormal EEG and, and have unusual episodes that may not be seizures. And uh, that's important to identify and distinguish from seizures in, in order to you know, prevent over-treating patients with medications that they may not need. And on the flip side, you know, um, seizures can be quite subtle and, and may be difficult to appreciate um, by eye. Um, they really run a spectrum from um, brief staring spells to uh, full-on convulsions. And, um, and so I think the biggest, you know, the, the most important tool we have at our disposal, and this sort of, sort of gets to the, to the work that, that we're doing, is uh, EEG, because EEG provides a direct readout of brain activity um, for a patient when they're awake, when they're asleep, um, and, and defines in many ways um, whether or not a, 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 an event is a seizure, and if, and if it is, what kind of seizure it is, um, with implications for what types of medication might be best to use, um, and, and, and um, what, what types of treatment might be ideal. And this is obviously something that a lot of uh, parents and their physicians have engaged with on an individual level to understand their child's condition. When we're talking about rare diseases like HIF-1A associated neurological disorder, uh, why is it so important to collate this data? Yeah, that, that's, that is the, the most important um, question, right? So, and it's because everybody's providers are working so hard to understand their epilepsy, understand that particular child. I do it too. We're, we're very focused on the EEG and how it's changing and whether or not medications are, are working. And that, that is all very rich information. Um, 
and especially the EEG data as rich information. But providers are seeing KIF-1A patients all, all over the world, um, and, and nobody is seeing a large number, and certainly there's not one place that's, that's reviewing all of that information. And so we're sort of in a situation where, where we're all sort of um, looking uh, at, at very specific pieces of information on, on just a, a patient or a handful of patients. Um, and there's no big picture perspective on what the EEGs look like across many patients, what it looks like in patients with different types of uh, variants and um, what the seizures uh, are like in, in the different patients and, and, and what medications seem to be most beneficial and what, you know, in, in, in certain um, situations. And so the purpose of, of this work and, and the importance of doing something like this is to be able to, for the first time, really provide that big picture perspective um, and see what we can learn because it's, it just hasn't really been done because as you said, it's quite, you know, it's quite challenging. Um, EEG data is not easily shared, unfortunately. You know, it's a lot of data. It re really requires um, that it be put onto some sort of media or stored in a cloud. And, um, and there's, you know, there's uh, privacy issues associated with sharing that data. And, um, and so, you know, whereas EEG reports are easily shared, they're, they're not the same as uh, having the same set of eyes looking at, um, at the squiggly lines uh, for across all of the different uh, individuals. And, and so that's really what we're trying to do and see, um, and see what we can learn when we, when we do that. Dr. Sands, this is obviously a, a very important study, and I'm sure that a lot of parents will be very excited to get their EEG data, you know, assessed uh, in this way. Um, how does this relate to, you know, the one-on-one -on -one clinical care that they're getting with their physicians and their EEG special, uh, specialists? Yeah, that's a really important question, and I'm glad you asked. Um, you know, this is this is really not meant to be uh, um, a second opinion. The, the idea is really you know, um, to, pro to provide at a, on a research basis, uh, a viewpoint across many individuals. Um, I, I think it's important to realize that, you know, the individual patients, doctors know them best. Um, and so this is really not meant to substitute in any way or, or provide any kind of clinical benefit directly to patients. It's really to ask what do we learn when we when we look at patients, uh, you know, in aggregate like this? As somebody who has engaged with this community, who's engaged with research and who's engaged with clinical practice, are there any other thoughts or uh, messages that you'd like to share with our CAN community? You know, I, I've been so impressed with this uh, with this community and and the level of organization and um, and activism that you know I'm I'm just really proud to be a part of the effort and um, I'm excited to see what what we can learn when we when we work together like this and I and so I would just say that it's it's quite a remarkable opportunity. Um, that uh, that I hope everybody takes advantage of.